-hmm. Hello, and welcome to the MIT SDM Systems Thinking webinar series. My name is Naomi Gutierrez, Communications Administrator for SDM, and I am today's host. Thank you for joining us. Today's speaker is Caitlin Mueller, Associate Professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technologies, Department of Architecture, and Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering in the Building Technology Program. She leads the Digital Structures Research Group, focusing on new computational design and digital fabrication methods for innovative, high-performance architecture in the built environment. Professor Mueller earned a PhD in Building Technology from MIT, a SM in Computation for Design and Optimization from MIT, an MS in Structural Engineering from Stanford University, and a BS in Architecture from MIT, and has practiced at several architecture and engineering firms across the US. Her talk today is titled Digital Design for High Performance Building Systems. If you have questions for Professor Mueller, please enter them into the chat window at the side of the video. They will be addressed during the Q&A portion of this session. The recording of this presentation will be available online after today's session. And Caitlin, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you so much, Naomi, for the invitation and the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here and to share my work with you today. Um, today, I'm going to talk about high performance design in architecture and buildings that I work on um, mainly with my research group at MIT called Digital Structures. We are an interdisciplinary group across architecture, structural engineering, mechanical engineering, computer science, applied math. We're really interested in interdisciplinary collaboration in general and specifically applied to um, high performance building design and construction inspired by some of our favorite projects from history, um, projects like these. Um, these are all buildings and structures that um, differ from each other substantially in how they look, in the materials they use, in their context, in their scale, in their form, and yet they're united in the ways that they use material efficiently. They're all using material only where it's needed, and they're able to, uh, to, to achieve this efficiency through formal innovation, through the way that the material is arranged. And I like to start with this reminder slide for me because it, it shows us that thinking interdisciplinarily and using technology and performance in design is not an overly constraining or restrictive approach, but it's actually one that unlocks and opens new ideas and helps us find new solutions uh, to, to common problems that we wouldn't find before. So for me, high performance design is beautiful, it's diverse, it's architecturally meaningful and intellectually elegant. The other reason that I find high performance design really important is because of the impact that buildings in the built environment have on climate change and our ability to do better than we're doing today. For example, these are two recently built Olympic stadia, the Beijing Olympic Stadium on the left, the London Olympic Stadium on the right. The Beijing Olympic Stadium emits 14 times the embodied carbon per seat in the stadium compared to the London Olympic Stadium. And this is due not to the materials themselves. Both of these designs are made out of steel, but in terms of how the materials are organized, the design decisions that affect both how the building looks also affect the way that the material um, is utilized. How efficiently are we using this material? Are we using it to its full potential? And this is a question that's hard to answer from the perspective of only one discipline. So performance-driven design really requires a kind of deep interdisciplinary collaboration that too often is lacking in common design pra uh, practices. One of the reasons that we got ourselves into this challenging situation is because of previous innovations in history. So um, in the beginning or at the, the end of the 20th, or end of the uh, 19th century, we developed new structural materials that allowed us to achieve longer spans and taller heights than we've ever had before. We also developed new ways to represent and analyze designs um, for architecture through CAD and finite element analysis. And both of these innovations became kind of standard in our, in our use uh, today, but they've taken us from a, a kind of design period in which we were dominated by the constraints of materials and representation and brought us into a world where anything is possible. We're in a very unconstrained landscape right now in the design of buildings. So for me, the questions that are critical in my discipline or in these, these constellations of disciplines are no longer questions of what's possible. We're no longer asking what can we build or how can we build it, but we need to ask what should we build and how should we build it in order to more responsibly use the resources that we have um, on this planet. 
One of the reasons that this is hard is because performance is most easily evaluated at the, at the end of the design process when we know the most about the design concept, but it's critical that we bring it in at the very beginning. Early in the design process when decisions aren't yet made are the best opportunity to help make the right decisions with data, with simulations, with performance. And yet too often um, technical and engineering information is not brought in until a design is already evaluated. This is also hard because of disciplinary boundaries. Um, for example, in the two fields that I work in, in architecture and structural engineering, we're literally talking about the same thing. We're talking about a building, and yet we're so often divided and um, isolated from each other. We, we think so differently about how the role of computation, how we fabricate and materialize things, and even how we educate our students. I think it's really important to bring these disciplines closer together so that we can approach problems from a more systematic and integrated uh, way. This is not a new problem either. This is a problem that people have been debating and critiquing for decades. These are two articles from the late 1950s and 1960s about this disciplinary conflict. And it's frustrating that we've been thinking about these problems for so long and do not appear to have resolved them. One possible answer is the, is the role of the computer, which could potentially form a kind of collaborative communication layer between disciplines. This was first explored in the design of the Sydney Opera House, which was the first building to be engineered with finite element analysis. And even at that time, engineers were really nervous about the role of the computer. Rather than seeing it as something that could expand potential, it was seen as something that was a threat that might take away the role of design from humans. And so I think this trio of architects, engineers, and computers are a little un, un, um, are nervous around each other. There's a bit of a contentious relationship, but it's something that can be, I think, very productive and, it, and this kind of collaboration between these three groups, I think is, is a way forward for a more sustainable built environment. How do we design buildings today? Um, as a very approximate um, version and to answer that question, we might say that we start with ideation. We start with kind of coming up with new design ideas um, in the architect's office and the architects select a design that, that we like. We send it over to the engineering office takes a really long time. The engineer runs a calculation, gets some numbers, turns out this design doesn't work. So what do we do? We go back to the architect's office, we try a different design, we send it all the way over to the engineers, we have to wait a really long time again for the answer. This time it works, wonderful, we move forward. This is obviously not a very integrated design approach. This is a design approach in which we've really only considered two, two options. Um, we don't have a lot of integration between analysis and simulation and synthesis and design. And we've almost certainly ended up with a solution that's not the best answer to the problem that we have at hand. How could we improve this? Um, first of all, 85% of buildings are designed this way. So it's, it's incredibly common. How do we improve this process? Um, one idea is to improve the connection between the idea generation phase of design and the analysis. So for example, we could build better software connections so that our, we get software simulation results in seconds or minutes or hours instead of days or weeks. Um, and this allows us to iterate through more solutions to be a little bit more systematic in our approach, um, but it's still essentially guess and check or trial and error. We could also try to systematize this further by creating what's called a design space, to essentially parameterize the problem with variables or sliders that control different geometries, link that all the way through with our analysis methods, then we're able to really iterate through even more solutions, but it's still essentially fast trial and error. And this is only about 3% of, of buildings in practice are designed with this kind of method at the, at the kind of early stage level. If, if you're coming at this from a purely engineering perspective, especially from a singular discipline, the solution is quite clear. You would link the whole system together into an optimization problem and solve the optimization problem to find the design. This is almost never used in the design of buildings. Um, and I think an interesting question is why. This technology has been around since before I was born. It's used in many other disciplines with success. Why don't architects and engineers use optimization as a, as a sort of analog for a design process? I would argue it's not because of any kind of technical limitations on the part of the architects or the engineers, but the fact that this kind of very formal optimization approach, while very powerful, is also incredibly restrictive and a very unnatural approximation for the creativity of human design. So for example, um, it only gives us a single solution and it's a fully automated process. It is often very slow and takes a long time for us to get a solution. 
Um, it's very unnatural in many cases to apply this kind of systems thinking. How do we actually come up with ways to parameterize a design problem is, is not, uh, not intuitive in many cases. Sometimes we set up this entire complicated system and the answer that we get at the end is, is obvious. So that raises the question of why we even invested time in this process. And then finally, it's really hard to integrate questions of material and construction into these abstractions um, in design. So in my work, I'm really interested in harnessing the power of systems thinking and, and optimization-based approaches, but applying them in ways that are relevant to a creative design problem like the design of buildings and the built environment, which are both incredibly important in terms of their role in contributing to climate change, but are also important cultural and human, um, uh, it, it's, the, it's the environment in which we live, the urban environment, the built environment, uh, is intrinsically human and our experience of that space is, in, is impossible to, to fully automate or fully um, explain to a computer. And so we need both. We need the power of optimization to improve performance, but we also need to understand how humans are going to experience the spaces we're designing. Another more elegant way to say this perhaps comes from the, the designers Charles and Ray Eames, who in 1972, as part of an exhibition, had a list of questions about design. One was, Ought form to derive from the analysis of function? Should form follow function? I think for many people, the answer is obviously yes. And their answer was, the great risk here is that the analysis may be incomplete. And that's the tension that I'm really interested in. The analysis is important, but we know it's incomplete. Um, one way that I investigate this more formally is through what we call the design space that I alluded to earlier. The design space is a way to link design decisions, often related to geometry in my work, but they can be more general, with metrics or measurements of performance. Here's an example of a really simple but interesting design space for a truss that supports a load. As I change the shape of the truss, as I move the lower left node up and down or left and right, the structure becomes more or less efficient. It requires more or less material to support the load. And we can visualize that in this really compelling landscape because we only have two variables. And this landscape in general is what we call the design space. The design space is implicit in any kind of parametric design problem in which we can, for example, use optimization to solve for the best solution. But the design space itself, I think, is much more interesting than just the optimal solution for the reasons I've mentioned. It's impossible for us to come up with a true objective function that captures all of the things we care about quantitatively in the design of buildings. And yet objective functions are still really useful because we can quantify some things, like how much material are we using, how much carbon are we emitting. Um, so for me, the design space uh, can be thought of as kind of a map of interesting solutions. And for example, if we look at the contours on this design space, these are designs that perform 10, 20, or 30% worse than the absolute optimal design in terms of material efficiency. And they open up a more diverse and interesting set of formal languages. As we relax a little bit away from the optimal solution, we have more possible solutions. And we might find one in this set that represents the best holistic mix of our quantitative and qualitative goals. So I'm really interested in not optimization in itself, but design space exploration as, a, as an optimization adjacent set of techniques that allow us to understand this as a landscape rather than a single solution that can help us uncover ideas we wouldn't find by ourselves that both perform well and meet kind of goals that we might not even know how to express. Um, one of the early tools I built to, to explore this idea is called Structure Fit which is a web-based tool that allows designers to design uh, the shape of long span trusses. Uh, the tool uses an interactive evolutionary algorithm in which it presents a subset of high-performing designs that it's generated to the user, along with their performance. In this case, uh, the number, the score represents material use, a lower number is better, and they're normalized by the original design. And then the user is able to select within this set designs that are especially interesting for human perceived reasons. And those are then recombined to generate new solutions. And so this is an evolutionary process in the sense that the designs tend to improve in performance over the exploration, but the exploration is also driven and navigated directly by the user. So we're not just taken to a single answer, but we're kind of opening up constellations of solutions or catalogs of design options. And I find this interesting, not only in terms of generating catalogs, but also in terms of allowing for users to directly interact with the computer. So things like direct manipulation, where we can adjust a model in a simple and intuitive way and get real-time feedback, I think is another cornerstone of good design tool, tools and good design thinking. 
with this type of approach, we can find a lot of interesting solutions that we would not have found just with optimization. On the left, we have the geometrically regular designs that we started with for structures. And as we move to the right, they become more efficient. They use their material um, more effectively. All the way on the right are designs that have been found in history to be very efficient that were designed with analytical methods akin to optimization. Um, so this approach can find optimal like solutions, but it also finds solutions that are maybe a more holistic blend of goals that are not the solution to any analytical objective function, but instead represent a balance between what we care about visually, what we care about contextually, culturally, and what we care about in terms of performance. And to me, this is really important to be able to incorporate both sides of that problem in order for these approaches to actually be used. Because architects know that visual and cultural meaning is such an important aspect of design, we can't throw it away. We need to make sure that we can incorporate it in our processes. And it also allows for more diversity. So again, there's not just a single way to use material efficiently. There's so many different ways that we can start to uncover um, that reflect the kind of the variation of geometrical possibilities, especially in three dimensions um, as we explore form. And so for me, this design space catalog that balances diversity and performance is, is a really compelling way to think about an alternative to optimization. These catalogs can be developed for any kind of problem type. We work on a lot of different sort of uh, design problems at the building scale. This is thinking about how to um, lay out shear walls, structural walls in a building floor plan that has implications both, both on spatial layout and experience and on structural behavior. Many of the problems we work on are in fact multi-objective. So we have multiple quantitative goals that we're able to express mathematically. And we want to understand how those trade off with each other, but also how that amplifies our ability to, to, to add our own qualitative assessment as well. So for example, here we're looking at the design of a shell-like structure where there's a trade off between the energy required to construct the building, the embodied energy, and the operational energy required to heat and cool and light the building. Um, and that trade off comes from, again, from geometry in this case. So certain types of geometries perform better in one metric and others perform better in the other. And with Techniques like multi-objective optimization, we can start to both understand that trade-off and make informed systematic decisions across disciplines that don't normally interact with each other. So for example, we've applied that technique to the design of long-span long building systems in different climates and different contexts. And what's interesting is the trade-offs change depending on where you are because the climate and weather is different in these different cities. And so it's a, it's a technique that, that really reveals new information when you apply it and enhances design and decision making. I'm also interested more generally in uh, expanding the diversity of what we're able to do with the computer. Um, human designers are incredibly good at coming up with divergent ideas in early stage design, especially very experienced designers. These are two um, of the world's best structural engineers and these are early sketches that they did in design ideation and design competitions. And one of the things that makes them the best designers in the world is their ability to do this, to brainstorm, not necessarily to do a really complicated finite element analysis, but to think really synthetically and conceptually across design domains. Um, how do we do this computationally? This is really, really hard to express design spaces that contain this degree of di diversity. Um, one of the ways that I've been interested in doing this is by thinking about alternatives to traditional parametric design spaces and thinking about things like rule-based or uh, grammatical design spaces, which represent designs not as a combination of parameters and a vector, but as a series of rule applications. Um, this borrows from ideas in language where we can formalize the way that sentences are created. Similarly, we can use rules to formalize the creation of design concepts. Um, so for example, a bridge could be generated by a series of rules that are applied in a very um, non-deterministic sequence so this, the same set of rules could allow us to generate really diverse solutions. If I press the random button, the random design generation button in this system that I created for bridges, I can get really diverse uh, design outcomes that might contain ideas that are similar to ones I've seen before, but also ones I would never have thought of. And so this kind of grammatical design uh, approach we think is, is really interesting, especially when connected to performance, because it allows us to use computation as early in the design processes as we can. Basically, when we start with a blank piece of paper, how do I create a structure that can transmit a load to supports? Um, if I'm starting from nothing, I can start with things like ideas of equilibrium, 
and use grammars to come up with really unusual ideas that are high performing that I would never have found by myself. Um, and we've applied these ideas in, in three dimensions and starting to come up with uh, really unusual solutions that are pushing the envelope in terms of formal language and design ideas and enhancing what we can do as human designers. One of the challenges that we found recently in our work is that once we define design spaces that are um, large enough to contain interesting ideas, they actually contain too much data. So this is a parametric design space, for example, for a long span roof, which we can vary geometrically um, in many ways, uh, which leads to a lot of interesting solutions, but also it leads to way, way, way too many solutions, not all of which are interesting. Um, it's very hard for us to make sense of this, obviously, as humans. Here, we're trying to visualize uh, the design space and we're only looking at a teeny tiny percentage of it. Even if we can analyze all of these designs, which takes time, um, we still don't get much of a sense of which designs we should choose or how they relate to each other, or it's very hard for us to extract meaning from this design problem. Um, and so in, in more recent work, I've been interested in addressing this question of, of too much data um, with things like machine learning. And I think advances in machine learning are, are making an impact in many disciplines. And in design, I see one of the unexpected um, benefits of machine learning is not to add complexity or to kind of take us further away from our sort of human, the human aspects of design, but actually to make human design more relevant again kind of harness and organize the chaos of these large design spaces into something that we can interact with again. One of the ways we do this is with something called surrogate modeling, which is a way to make simulations and computational response that's normally too slow to allow us to be creative and make it instantaneous, basically to learn approximations of simulations in order to give us real-time information when we're making decisions or uh, design actions. And this comes from theory about of being in the creative flow in which you need feedback from a computer in 200 milliseconds or less. Surrogate modeling is a way to generate this data-driven approximation or regression model that gives us the simulation in real time. So for example, if an architect or a designer is sculpting a shape for a shell, instead of sending it to an engineer and waiting a week to get the simulation results back, we can pack that into a surrogate model and get real-time feedback instantaneously. And so the human can focus on being creative and exploring form, but immediately have the information and the feedback about what those formal decisions mean in terms of engineering efficiency and performance. We can also expand this idea not only to predict the performance or to predict simulation results, but we can even predict, for example, the optimal distribution of material. These are results from a, from a um, topology optimization approach which is a way to um, organize or assign material optimally across a domain to resist loads. It also really results in these really beautiful patterns that kind of express the natural flow of forces in nature. Um, but the problem is it takes a long time to run and usually requires proprietary or difficult to use software. With surrogate modeling, we can build a really lightweight and portable approximation, for example, of, of the topology optimization results that across a diverse range of, of examples is pretty accurate and also is um, quite fast. So, so two orders of magnitude faster than running the actual simulation. And again, what that allows us to do from a design perspective is immediately get information about material allocation and how that looks in response to changing the design shape. So as I'm sculpting this structure, which could be a long span roof or a bridge, I'm seeing instantaneously the change in material allocation from this surrogate model that then gets projected into a final kind of materialized design. I can really understand what it will look like um, while I'm still designing in a very abstract way. And I can also use this information to inform kind of more, um, uh, less, less literal translations of, this, of the topology optimization into things that are potentially buildable. Finally, the last area of surrogate modeling that I've been working on is how to make surrogate models really generalizable. So it's a supervised learning method that has the challenge of requiring a large data set in order to work. But we've recently been able to show that we can use recent advances in, um, in deep learning on geometry, geometric deep learning, together with transfer learning to, for example, train a neural network to predict the structural behavior of a bridge on a large set of data of different bridges. And then with transfer learning, show that that same model could be used with a little bit more data 
to predict the behavior of towers. Um, and this is powerful because it means that these surrogate models are going to start to become generalizable things that are these portable, lightweight um, expressions of simulation and performance that go from proprietary and clunky and difficult to access to things that are going to be accessible to everyone and usable in, in a lot of different uh, design scenarios. So we're really excited about this, um, the possibility of having instantaneous performance feedback that has normally not played a role in design. So what do we do with this feedback once we have it? How do we start to organize this um, large and expansive set of data that represents the design space into something that's meaningful for humans so that we can connect our natural design abilities with the power of the computer? Methods like unsupervised learning that, for example, can find patterns in data could be used to cluster the design space into meaningful families or typologies. I think there's a lot of really interesting work to be done in this area. Um, but what, what we've been focusing on more recently are under, using machine learning and data science to find directions or ways to move through the design space that correlate with um, things that we're interested in related to performance. So, for example, I, I alluded earlier to the fact that the parameterization problem in design is really unnatural. So we set up all of these decisions that we might have to make, but what I really care about is how those decisions affect the things that I care about, the quantitative metrics of performance. I wanna understand that relationship in a holistic global way. I can't do that automatically. That's kind of like an inverse problem. I need to, I wanna know the output based on the input, but machine learning and statistical methods can help guide that and build, build a bit of a sense of how these, these are related so that I can start to move directly within the directions of performance that I care about. So for example, using, using something like um, canonical correlation analysis, which is a pretty old statistical technique, we can find directions in the design space by making linear combinations of our original variables so that we now have sliders that correspond directly to the performance objectives that we care about. We can do this with similar techniques like principal component analysis, where we essentially create synthetic variables or reduce a reduced dimensionality of our design space so that we can see a large variation in geometry in response to performance in a way that doesn't overburden us with investigating too many options, but points us to an interesting area to explore while still giving us a lot of freedom and a lot of diversity in the types of designs we're seeing. Another way to do this that um, takes advantage of more recent advances in, in machine learning is to use a latent space that can be achieved through something like a variational autoencoder or a generative adversarial network. Um, these latent spaces have made a big impact in many fields, but in our world, we see this as a, as a dimensionality reduction technique that harnesses, again, this kind of expanse of an original over, overpopulated design space and comes up with a human legible map of design alternatives that are interesting and relevant. And so in our work, we specifically pay, pay attention to performance. And so we want this latent space to be conditioned to only include designs that have high performance, but also still to focus on design diversity. And this latent space is literally, can literally be a landscape. So here we go, we're going from 36 original design variables to back to two so that I can have this landscape, this design space of alternatives. This is not the literal design space. This is called the latent design space, but it's very similar to the one I showed you earlier. And what it means is that as a designer, I can literally move through this space by, by clicking on this, on this landscape or by moving two sliders in two directions and achieve a lot of variation in, perform or in, in visual effect. I can see a lot of different designs that are interesting. I see how they relate to each other. I can interpolate between one and another. I can start to com compare ideas in a really systematic way again. I have a sense of performance. I have a performance map directly in my, in my landscape. And yet I'm still, I'm seeing uh, way more variation than any kind of two dimensional design space I could set up by hand. And so this allows us to take this kind of chaotic design space and start to understand how designs relate to each other in terms of both form and performance. We can also apply this idea um, with, with surrogate modeling again. So here is the example I showed earlier where we're changing the design uh, and understanding the topology optimization result in real time. And now we're seeing a two-dimensional latent space that allows us to understand systematically how different designs in the space relate to each other. So we're really excited about these performance-based latent spaces. Um, I think this is not 
accessible in the immediate future to a general community, but we think we're getting there with kind of proving that this works. I think we're going to see a lot of these ideas start to make. Um, there is a challenge in terms of data and training uh, to kind of make these ideas accessible for people who haven't studied machine learning. And one of the related challenges is that we don't have enough data. We're almost always working with synthetic data that we've generated ourselves. And we need to start working with wild data, data of real designs um, out in the world. Um, and I think hopefully we'll start seeing more publicly created databases that these techniques can start to build on. Um, finally, I have the question here, how do we, how do we even uh, more strongly bring the, the human designer into these machine learning powered methods? And this is a project I've been working on, um, sponsored by the National Science Foundation, where we want to remove the idea of parameterization altogether, um, where we want the designer to be working in the most analog and basic and, and intuitive way possible, um, sketching. But we want to be able to connect this really powerful uh, mode of expression and exploration with the power and systematic uh, nature of the formalized design space. So we're doing this with a method similar to the, to the variational autoencoder I showed earlier, where we're able to basically project a sketch into a, para, into a, a parameterized design space, um, estimate its performance with a surrogate model from a sketch. Um, and in this case, we have two sketches. And once we project them into this latent space, we're able to, for example, um, interpolate new designs based on the designs we've input. So we see this as a way to expand design space exploration from something that's really only in the domain of experts who've learned how to use the system to something that can really be used by anyone who likes to design through sketching. So I think th this is empowered by machine learning, but is really connected to the, to the human side of design. We're also interested in teaching these ideas more generally, um, to, especially to creative designers and architects um, and engineers who are interested in learning them. We've been teaching a class at MIT for a few years called Creative Machine Learning Design. This is with my colleague, um, Dr. Renaud Deneuve. And um, he and I are working on developing an online um, mass, a, a MOOC based on the, the, the residential class that will launch in a few months on the MITx online platform. We also release a lot of open source tools that encapsulate the knowledge that I've shown you today. So if you're interested in exploring some of these ideas in your own work, um, please check out these tools that work in the Rhino and Grasshopper environment. The final part of my talk, I wanted to talk a little bit about how to get um, these designs out of the computer. Um, I think I'm really convinced that these computational techniques can expand the kind of visual palette of architecture and help us find new ideas while also improving performance substantially. But a lot of times the ways that we express performance on the computer don't translate into savings in the real world. And a lot of that has to do with the differences between um, material quantities, which are easy to estimate, and costs, which are not, which are often also based on the complexities of construction that are associated with added labor and, um, and logistics. So a lot of times the designs that we think are efficient on the computer are actually very challenging to build. One way to address this um, that I'm interested in is harnessing recent advances in um, digital fabrication and manufacturing, robotic assemb uh, assembly, to make structures that seem complex um, just as easy to build as their standardized counterparts. So for example, this is a lattice structure that's um, morphing to become more and more structurally efficient, requires less material as it achieves this kind of more interesting form. But as it becomes more efficient, every node in the truss is different. Every member has a different length. Um, conventional construction would say that this is a huge cost premium despite the, the reduction in material use. However, um, in digital fabrication, these economics are often quite different. Um, complexity is at least uh, significantly reduced in cost, if not free. And so, for example, if a robot is extruding this lattice truss with a kind of 3D printer head that we've mounted to it, it's just as easy for every node to be the same as it is for every node to be different. And this optimized truss here that the robot printed in our lab, every node is different, every member has a different length, the resulting design is one that expresses performance through its form, and yet it's just as easy for the robot to have made this as it is to make something that looks like it's from the last century. 
Robotics in construction are becoming uh, more common and there's a lot of large scale investigation of the potential of this technique. This is a collaboration we did with Branch Technology, which is a US based startup doing large scale um, extruded lattice 3D printing. And so we worked with them to design this optimized bench and to construct it. Um, and we see this as promising, uh, not only in 3D printing, but this kind of general idea of using the, uh, the, the, flex, the, the precision and automation of the robot to make structures that would otherwise be impossible to build um, affordable. This is another example with a more complex structure. This is a, a topology that's been optimized, meaning all of the connectivity between all of the elements is really um, engineered to transmit load efficiently, but it also leads to a, a very complex structure. Um, thanks to advances in, in robotic path planning, we're able to automate this process. And so we can make uh, the structure that normally would stay on the computer in real life and make structures that would be really, really hard for us to build by hand. So here's this robot extruding a topology optimized beam. You can think of this like a bridge. Um, we probably wouldn't extrude the full bridge, but we could certainly extrude building scale elements that could be assembled. Um, but we can also think about this robot with the extruder as a kind of metaphor for a general robotic assembly. So instead of extruding, the robot could also be holding um, a linear element in timber or steel. Um, and what's automated here is the, the sequence in which the robot is adding material. And um, it's taking into account, it's avoiding collision, it's accounting for the mechanics of the structure in its partially assembled state. And it's also planning all the, uh, it's doing all of the path and, and motion planning. Um, and so right now this takes a while for it to compute, but we're getting faster and faster so that we think this kind of robotic logic could actually become a driver in the design process itself. We're also interested in more practical and ubiquitous applications of this kind of thinking. Um, one really high impact area of, of urgent research is building construction in the global south in developing countries where we need a huge amount of housing and construction in general, and yet we also need to be cognizant of the effects that construction have on climate change. Um, in my group, we've particularly targeted concrete construction and specifically looked at floors. This might sound like a kind of boring topic, but floors actually embody most of the carbon emissions and material in a building. Um, and they're among the, most, the least efficient structures in a building um, when built with standard methods. Um, by shaping or sculpting a floor, by removing material that's not needed to transmit load structurally, we can substantially reduce emissions within the element, but also at the building scale um, by 50 or 60 or 70 percent, depending on the, the exact parameters of the problem. The only reason we typically build the, the normal extruded flat slab that you see here on the left is because in conventional construction, it's seen as cheaper. It's easier to build a flat rectangle, even though most of the material is not needed structurally. Um, if we unlock the idea that we can, we can change the form and we can be more flexible with the structure, we can use ideas like optimization and design space exploration to uncover new geometries that use material incredibly efficiently, but that can also be connected with fabrication processes and available technologies in context. So here we're working with partners um, in Delhi and India to build a prototype of, of one of these optimized floor systems as a single unit that gets arrayed to create a floor. And we built this with um, conventional steel formwork, laser cut and singly curved spot welded together, which is a very common technology in this part of the world that our expert partners were able to deploy quite easily. The only thing that was new is the geometry, but this geometry unlocked significant material savings while still performing um, and testing it at full scale um, as expected. So safely transmitting loads, but using a lot less material. This idea also unlocks new ways to think about space and form in buildings. So if the structure starts to play a more active role, it also participates in the design itself and your experience of space. These beautiful beams become sculptures on the ceiling that express the efficiency of the building. Um, we can pursue similar ideas in other materials as well. Um, timber is especially um, of interest in architecture and design lately because of its ability to reduce carbon emissions. But a lot of times um, in recent advances in timber, it's being used in so-called mass timber buildings um, in very large bulky sections that are mostly using material um, that's not working very hard. So again, we can follow ideas of, of the flow of forces and geometry to unlock improved performance and express the kind of flow of forces through 
beautiful shaped sculptures that also use substantially less material and reduce our resource consumption. Finally, um, we're advancing some of these ideas about resource use um, in a more speculative way, looking at um, working with found material and upcycling um, in general. Uh, trees are a wonderful source of material for buildings, but um, often we overlook some of their most compelling assets. For example, tree forks or tree branches are amazing naturally engineered structural connections. They're moment connections with internal fiber structures that are optimized by nature to transmit loads. It would be impossible with today's technologies to 3D print something as complex as the internal fiber structure of a tree joint. Um, and yet we typically throw them away. We don't use them in, in most construction because we see them as kind of overly complex and filled, filled with uh, non-straight grains that we don't know how to use. If we instead treated tree bat branches or tree forks as our source or our kind of the seed of the design process, what would design look like? How, would, how could we change the way that we design to be directly responsive to av available materials in irregular geometries? Um, in this project, we worked with a local partner with the, the city of Somerville who were taking down trees for various construction projects in the city. Um, and normally these trees get um, mulched and then used for landscaping, um, which is good because there's some purpose for this, but is bad because all of the, the carbon that is sequestered in the trees gets released um, in a very short period of time. So instead, we, we worked on salvaging some of this material before it was chipped and starting to think about how to inventory found material using things like 3D scanning to create a digital library, a digital inventory of the materials that we collected. And then we developed design approaches to um, use this material in effective ways. In this case, we're, we're using an algorithm that automatically assigns elements from our inventory to our design and then changing the design in response to this. How do we optimize the design to best use the material that we have? Which is a different question than the traditional questions of structural optimization. Um, we're also working with advances in digital fabrication to make the construction of this kind of system scalable. So for example, we can automatically compute all of the instructions for the robot to debark these tree branches with a limited number of cuts with a bandsaw. Um, so even though each tree branch is different, it doesn't add a lot of manual overhead to process them all individually. Um, and then what we end up with is kind of like a kit of parts. We end up with something very similar to a prefabricated construction system, but instead of um, a, a kit of standardized or self-similar parts, our kit contains all of these different um, parts that come from the organic geometry of the trees, but they allow the assembly process to be incredibly simple and low tech, where the, the, the nodes themselves express the geometry and register the pieces together so that two humans can pretty easily uh, assemble a large scale structure with high precision, um, thanks to the, to the logic that is embedded in the, the fibers of the wood and the geometry of the joints. So we're interested in this as a way to reconcile the, the design generation of form and architecture with the intent of the designer, of course, but also structural efficiency, material availability, and the constraints of fabrication. And we think this is a, a really interesting and ongoing area of work that um, design can be responsive to upcycled materials, which will allow for us to use what we have more efficiently, extract less from the earth, and find new and creative ways for us to express the kind of values of our time. So in conclusion, um, I hope that I inspired a little bit of um, interest in you in, in architecture and computing. I think computing is a powerful tool for both amplifying our creativity, but also allowing us to understand performance. Thanks to this climate crisis that we've found ourselves in, um, it's imperative that we consider performance in design. Computation, uh, geometry, data science, machine learning, these tools can allow us to do this in an integrated and natural way so that we can balance between systematic design space exploration driven by performance, the creative and flexible and free side of design that's driven by human intuition and creativity, and um, new fabrication technologies that can make um, these new forms and designs economical to build um, in, in, with tomorrow's methods. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Caitlin. This was fascinating. And especially we hear so much in our own SDM core class about 
system architecture and starting with the design space, but it's often much more metaphorical than the ones that you're talking about. So it's really interesting for me to see it as the start of an actual physical design that will theoretically become a physical structure. Uh, so it looks like we do have a few questions that have already come in. So I'll just start right with those. And if more of our viewers have questions, again, please enter them into the chat window. So Steve Wagner asks, is there anything interesting or challenging about including factor of safety rules in your modeling and displaying these to users? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, obviously, uh, understanding safety factors is incredibly important in, in architecture and structural engineering. A lot of this has already been done. Like, uh, There's been a lot of really powerful work in statistics and probability in structural engineering that have produced very high quality safety factors that balance risk across different material systems and different loading scenarios so that we have a lot of confidence that when we follow um, not necessarily prescriptive, but when we follow analysis methods that are that are um, allowed by code, we're already balancing safety factors in a in a in a very fair and safe way. Um, so in our work, we always we always use that as as the input for our analysis methods to make sure that we're doing that correctly. Um, I think thinking more generally about balancing risk and safety um, is really interesting. Um, obviously, there's a trade-off between material efficiency and redundancy and robustness. And I think that's a very important and interesting thing to, to query and try to quantify, because if we kind of fall too strongly in one camp, just out of gut feeling without really looking at numbers, we, we might make the wrong decision and either be overly conservative or overly dangerous. And so I think, yeah, understanding risk is something that's central to structural engineering and um, Yes, it's something that we, we absolutely do in, in, in all structural engineering work, but, but could be considered more explicitly in, in, in certain areas. And I think that's a great idea. Yeah, safety is definitely crucial for the built environment. Um, so Jorge Aponte thinks that the uh, machine generated designs are beautiful, but had a couple of questions about uh, how to translate that design to the real world of bricks and concrete and was asking if there are any current examples of that and also asks about the problem in many cities of making low-income housing accessible, affordable, and beautiful and asks how these techniques could make those more possible in other cities. Yeah, great, great question. And I, I tried to allude to a, a bit of this in the, in the end of my talk. Um, I think uh, it's very obviously very important that we connect with the real world of, of bricks and concrete and that real world, you know, maybe more plastic than we think. I think one, one challenge that I see is that the construction sector um, is sometimes slow to innovate and it becomes kind of a set of uh, so-called rules of thumb or prescriptive knowledge that's not questioned. And so whether something is easy or hard to do is not always actually measured, but just kind of, well, it was hard to do 20 years ago, so we can't do it. Um, I think advances in, in the digital fabrication and, and related technologies that I showed um, make some of these structurally efficient ideas quite feasible to implement in uh, low cost scenarios. And in fact, we do a lot of work in low cost housing in areas of the world where the cost of materials dominates the construction cost. So that's true, for example, we're working on in Mexico with partners on that, in India, and in, in many emerging economies, that's true. Um, in, in the United States, obviously, that's not true. The construction costs are dominated by the cost of labor. I think that's also an opportunity. If we make things that use less material but require more labor, on the one hand, yes, that might increase costs, but perhaps we can find a way to do that in a way that's cost neutral, but provides more income for people and, and upskills them in terms of jobs. So I think that's another positive outcome of this, that we can connect this, um, at, at these ideas as an inspiration for improving our capabilities um, in the United States and in the world in terms of uh, skill and knowledge of construction systems, deploying that in order to, to create these low carbon uh, structural systems in, in many contexts. In housing in particular, uh, these ideas are, are, can have a lot of impact. Um, housing is one of the most ubiquitous building types. And so in terms of square footage or square meters, um, it's, it's a really important area to focus on. It's also an area that directly affects human experience and sort of uh, quality of life substantially. It's an area that for a long time wasn't considered um, 
an interesting engineering problem because the scale is relatively small, the loads are relatively small, but because of the ubiquity, any kind of improvement in, in the engineering performance has huge rewards in terms of cost and carbon and materials saved. So I think it's a really important area to, to focus on. That absolutely makes a lot of sense. And just going back to what you were saying about kind of the construction industry relying on what's familiar, uh, for anybody who is around the MIT campus, we've had a lot of new construction over the past couple of years. And it is really funny to see how these buildings look pretty much like any other skyscraper you might see, you know, rectangles, uh, lots of plate glass windows, and it's like, oh, okay, so even though we're in the middle of this center of innovation, there's not a lot of innovation happening in the current construction right now, at least to the casual observer. So it'd be fascinating to see more of these ideas kind of gain traction, even here at MIT. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it looks like we have a question from Anne Lowery asking, what sort of changes to the construction industry might be required to implement these digital-based solutions? Um, yeah, great, great question. Um, well, one change is just um, um, kind of a willingness to accept and familiarize ourselves with new technologies. Um, and, you know, we have systems that, that we use now in construction that, that sort of work, but they also enforce the status quo and make it really challenging for us to, to try new things. So I think just one, one thing is a kind of cultural shift of a willingness to innovate. For me, the, the climate imperative is, is something that maybe makes this possible, that we really can't continue business as usual. And it's, it's incredibly uh, important and mandatory in some sense that we, we disrupt the way that we currently think. Um, so part of it is cultural. I think a part of it is about upscaling and learning technologies and transferring some of these ideas from boutique projects to ubiquitous projects. Um, I think part of it also has to do with um, how we think about cost. Um, cost is, is, is often this kind of very difficult to understand question because profits and things are, 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 are uh, wrapped up in, in costs that a client sees from a contractor. If we could build more transparent cost models that allowed us to track both monetary economic costs and also carbon costs in the design process, that would allow us to use some of these techniques to make really good decisions. Um, so I think having better connections between accurate cost and carbon modeling and design ideation would be really important. I think that makes a lot of sense on both sides. Um, kind of tying into the climate concerns, Praveen Charles asks about your point of view on modeling non-recyclable waste into future material and build structures? Yeah, um, modeling non-recyclable, You right, so using non-recyclable waste or upcycling waste as, um, as a building material. I think that's, um, I'm, I'm very excited about that idea. I think there's a lot of potential for that. There's a huge history of that. Throughout the history of human construction, we have thrown terracotta pots into concrete that, you know, slabs that we're casting. We have a lot of, um, a lot of uh, experience with this as a, as a human uh, civilization, but it's not something, it's not something we've, see, we've seen in recent industrialized construction. Challenges include um, scaling and logistics. We're so used to these hyper-standardized supply chains that working with anything irregular seems to add a lot of cost and headache at the moment. So I think Finding ways for us to be more flexible with material sourcing, which is a bit of a cultural question and a bit of a technical question, I think is, is important. The other, the other question, of course, from an engineering perspective is characterizing this, these waste materials and seeing how they can be best used. Um, with the tree branches, uh, I know that those are very good structural materials and, and there's a lot of existing engineering knowledge about how they perform. With kind of more generalized waste, especially post-consumer waste, it's not always possible to use that um, those materials structurally, they don't necessarily have the material properties we want, but they could be used for things like formwork. That, you know, there are many places that they could be used um, to uh, reduce our, our consumption of virgin materials. So I think it's a, a very important area for more research. That makes a lot of sense. And especially, I think we're all quite aware of the ongoing supply chain disruptions right now. So that might cause some reevaluation for uh, this sector, as well as many others. 
Um, Arne Hessenbruch, I apologize if I mispronounce that, asks, whether this could be used by municipalities or regulatory authorities to grade designs and give tax credits, which I think is a big question, but an interesting one. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a great idea. Um, I, in general, we have a kind of, uh, I, in my opinion, we don't have enough um, regulation about design performance. And so having a kind of, um, having frameworks, uniform, unified frameworks, that are organized at the governmental level that allow us to assess designs from an, at least an environmental performance perspective and compare them uh, and set benchmarks is an incredibly important thing that I think we need to do. We, don't, we, have so literal, we have so little literacy about, for example, embodied carbon emissions. Um, nobody has a sense of what the numbers should even be. So starting to um, use this, for example, for federally funded infrastructure projects, should we, ask every, every designer who's submitting a proposal for an infrastructure project to quantify the embodied carbon in their design, I think absolutely. Um, then we can start using these, these methods to find designs that are better. Um, and I think that's also really exciting, but just as a baseline, understanding performance um, in, in, in all projects, but especially federally funded projects, I think is a great idea. Yeah, I feel like I've only started seeing the term embodied carbon being used in, you know, casual mainstream news sources, for instance, very recently. So yeah. I'm sure this is something that's been discussed for a long time in the field, but it's only One becoming... Of the it's so important, and I think we've seen more focus on it recently, is because unlike operational carbon, which is the carbon used over time by a building, embodied carbon is happening right now, or it's just happened. So it's, it's all the energy used to create the materials to transport them to the site and it's done. Um, so when the building opens, we've already spent a huge amount of carbon to make it possible. And so in terms of its immediate impacts on climate change, it's, it's su substantial. And we, we know that we need to reduce carbon today, not just in 50 years. Makes a great deal of sense. Uh, it looks like we have one more question. I think we have time for this. Uh, again, from Anne Lowry, is there upskilling required for building code officials for non-traditional structures and how would that work? Great question. Um, I, I, yes, I suspect uh, working with building code will be one of the challenges that we see as we try to advance some of these design concepts. Building code is in many, you know, building code is highly uh, differentiated because it, it, you know, it's, it's created at the state or even municipal level. And so it's very hard to have kind of global changes to building code, but I think that that is a very important step. And we've seen examples where new materials, for example, or new design methods are introduced into the building code. Um, and so I think there are pathways to do that. For example, tall timber is being pushed through building codes in various municipalities to advance the idea of, of using lower carbon materials for urban construction, and they've been successful with that. So I think there are models, um, but, but you're absolutely right that that is one of the challenges. I think that makes sense, but just because it's challenging doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, just because it's hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's an excellent note to end on. So thank you to our audience for attending this webinar. The presentation recording will be available here on YouTube after we finish. We will be sending out information soon about the next Systems Thinking webinar. And thank you once again to Caitlin Mueller for speaking today. And on behalf of the System Design and Management Program, thank you all for joining us.